now we are live and i'll just Yay. check let's see if we're live are we live we should be live it looks well I we see are a live. live sign we are live we are definitely mm. live i'm it's gonna play happening. it's happening yeah all right oh here we are okay mm -hmm. i retweeted okay it. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, listening to myself. <laughs> okay, well, I am here with Dr. Natalie. Hi. And, hi, I'm, I'm going to go back. This is a, my first live stream uh, of maybe many, or maybe just the one. <laughs> it depends on how much of a disaster this one ends up being. Yes, or how brilliant it will be. Or how brilliant it will be. Um, well, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, we were going to talk about power dynamics because mm. you were watching this uh, this interview that I did with Nikki Klein. And also, I mean, power dynamics in general are, seem to be always a very relevant topic. And with the whole Tate situation as well, um, I think is is uh, particularly relevant. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of things that I kind of missed in some ways, like watching back some of the stuff and thinking back um, that I feel like I didn't quite get into, maybe because I have a little bit of a blinder myself um, in terms of how much responsibility I think people should take or take or how much responsibility I take in situations, which I think is a lot. Um, but I think um, in kind of reflecting on a lot of it, I, uh, you know, there's one, there's, there's distinctions. One is legal distinction when it comes to taking responsibility uh, as an adult, when you get in, into situations where there is some kind of an implicit consent when you are, you know, when you consent to something and there is maybe some kind of a power dynamic because if we didn't have uh, consent to some extent and, you know, later sort of change your mind, we would never be able to sort of make these kinds of legal determinations. But on the other hand, it, there is something different when it comes to these power dynamics uh, it doesn't mean that somebody can be more fragile in a in a relationship, whether it's between friends or in a in a romantic relationship, where one could take a, or a business relationship where one could take advantage of another person and their vulnerabilities, and from a more moral or ethical point of view or just a practical point of view, that could be a lot more complicated then, you know, one party's consenting and that's it. What are your thoughts on that? I'd love, I'd love to get your thoughts. Yeah, consent is an interesting uh, well, a concept in action because uh, we are using the information we have uh, to agree or not agree to do something or be partake in something. And if you're someone who takes things more literally or you trust somebody's word you might be giving your consent to you know go into some sort of project or relationship or or form of friendship with that person based on a key set of assumptions you're making about that person and your willingness to trust them and their word but we humans have a whole bunch of other things going on unconsciously um, our own needs and what we want that person to do for us and that's not necessarily explicit in the agreement, but it becomes the package of what has been consented to. Um, and I don't know if I'm making sense. It's just a lot of the, the stuff that's verbal and explicit, and there's a lot of things that are implicit and nonverbal and unsaid. And this is the way we are in any relationship, unless you're somebody who's very um, alert to the fact that you wanna be transparent about everything um and you're trying to promote that transparency in the other person about what 
what do they want from the relationship? What are their goals? What do they want to achieve? And how might we negotiate a way of working with each other that you know, brings our actions out in the open and so that if we have a conflict or we have um, access to new information that makes us want to change our mind, that we negotiate a way of doing things differently or maybe ending the relationship. This is uncommon in friendships, romantic relationships, um, in many relationships. It might be more common in some business relationships or collaborations where there's contractual agreements. But what I'm trying to say is there's a lot behind consent that is unsaid. So you might go, I'm going to start a collaboration with this person. We're going to, the purpose is we're going to, you know, do some research on something and publish this work. But there's a relational component between us and there's some of our, our own issues and past wounds and insecurities that are going to come come to the fore. And if one of the person is quite exploitative, um, but I don't see them that way and they start to do things that take advantage of me and I didn't see it coming, well, I didn't consent to being taken advantage of. That wasn't part of the arrangement. So I didn't know that that was coming or I didn't notice the red flags for me to adjust my expectations or um, negotiate <clears throat> an agreement of how we're going to be. Um, so I might be taken advantage of by this person. Um, and then I go, well, I'm responsible for my actions because I'm responsible for what happened because I consented to this. But I didn't consent to that aspect of the arrangement, but it's what ended up happening. So hopefully yeah. that articulated this, this idea about consent, the said and the unsaid. Yeah, and often people just don't see it when they're the ones in it because, um, you know, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine and, um, you know, she's able, we were talking about how she's able to sort of see the red flags in, in the situations that I've been in, uh, like, very easily. But also, I conversely have been able to see the red flags immediately in her situations but it, when we're in it, it's just completely different because I think our perceptions of the people involved are so skewed uh, because of our relationships to them and also how we see the, those individuals. We have sort of these inaccurate uh, perceptions of these people uh, because of how we define our relationships to them and, and not maybe sometimes wanting to even accept who they are. Um, and that, and I think that that could make things extra complicated. Yeah, we have a lot of blind spots and the things, and I talk about this a lot, is a lot of, um, we're shaped the way we, you know, relate with others is shaped by our earliest relationships with our parents or caregivers and those who played a part in, in you know, raising us and influencing us. So if there's been some uh, dysfunctional relating dynamics or, you know, I'm used to somebody, a parent invalidating my feelings or my experiences, then I'm going to, and that's been my normal, I'm not going to see that as invalidation. I'm going to see that as that's just relating. So I'm going to enter into relationships that uh, are going to feature this kind of invalidation of my feelings and experiences because that's what's familiar and normal to me. That creates a blind spot to, um, towards what could be quite abusive or hurtful or harmful um, in my life because, well, that's just normal. Yeah, something that you brought up uh, that you observed in the interview that I did with Nikki um, that uh, about Nexium and, and, and something that I missed because in large part because I, uh, you know, it's been so long since I have did sort of a deep dive into it uh, was the branding that, um, that was done uh, uh so not so much that there was even like uh brand uh not so much that the branding that was done but that there was the the initials and those initials belong to individuals and kind of thinking about that, that that's kind of a major thing uh and i wish i had brought that up but uh because that it in terms of power uh, thinking back on that, that that represents power because it's individuals. It's not just like it could have been, you know, the the branding of the organization, the branding of the, you know, this, uh, whatever that was, right? Uh, it could have been 
anything but the initials of specific individuals. And what, by making it that, it, it, se it did seem to be a, like a power, uh, di it plays into a power dynamic. So I wish I could have asked about that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll follow mm -hmm. up. Um, similarly, I see that with, um, you know, the whole Andrew Tate situation where he had branding of the tattoos uh, that these women have, you know, Tate's girl or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah. And I mean, uh, and, it's, and you could say, well, that, that was done willingly, right? That they, they're happy with it. Some of them say mm -hmm. they have zero regret. Um, they're proud of it, all of that stuff. Right. And, and you know what, you, you also know that, you know, women, men, you know, they get, they fall in love, they get each other's name. Although in Tate's situation, you would say, it's not like he got their name on him. Mm. <laughs> I would point that out. What are your, what are your thoughts there? Like what, why, <laughs> why is that happening? Why are people willing to do it? And why is it so one way? Yeah. Um, well, I think for, and let's just be clear, it's women who are the ones being branded, not the men, uh, as far as yeah. I know. Um, uh, there's a perception per potentially from the women's end that it is two way, that they're consenting in this like amazing arrangement. They start, they believe that this arrangement that they're in is beneficial for them. And it's something that they're proud of enough that they would want it, you know, seared into their flesh, um, uh, which is, you know, a painful process in itself. But what's being seared into the flesh is an init initials or name belonging to that man. So it represents ownership of that man of their body. And that might not be part of the messaging, but that's what it is. And I don't think there'd be any woman who's undergone that process <clears throat> and believes in this arrangement that they would believe that they don't have agency. Their narrative is going to be, of course, I consented to this. Of course, I want this. Of course, this, you know, I feel special or I feel this is, you know, important signal in my relationship to you know my commitment to this person and this relationship or whatever it represents no one's going to want to think that they've actually been groomed and over progressively you know um submitting to this person unless they're clearly in a you know a relationship where there's a clear dominant person and a clear uh you know per, uh, the other person who submits and that's this kind of explicit arrangement which can happen in you know kink or BDSM relationships. That's not clear that that's happened here. It's somebody who's very dominant has, you know, put out a bunch of narratives that have been internalized by susceptible women who are, you know, buy into it and they believe in it and they still believe they have some sort of power agency or empowerment. But when somebody is searing their initials into your body, that's saying they own you. They own you for eternity as long as you've committed. And even if you've decided you've changed your mind and you've exited that relationship, there's still this impression that, um, you know, there's, you're still owned until you find a way to dismantle the beliefs and values that you've internalized about that person in that relationship and kind of extract it out of your system so that you can reclaim yourself because you're still owned until then, in my opinion. Well, in these BDSM relationships, it's like, uh, uh, where do you draw that line of distinction between these relationships and these BDSM relationships where a key component is kind of submitting and giving up your power and allowing that person to sort of have control and, and, and you know, kind of consenting to that same thing in a, in, in a way? Where, mm. where is that line of distinction in your view? It's a great question. It's a great point you make and a great parallel that you draw between these two types of relationships. And again, there's no one way there'll be, you know, diverse ways of expressing these dynamics, these master slave kind of dynamics. Um, I think from my understanding, there is uh, agreements like explicit agreements that are made about the role that each person is going to play and how long that's going to last for and when it stops, whereas in the other, if we're looking at the, you know, Tate or the Nexium or any sort of culty thing, there's never an intent for that person to no longer submit to the master. 
it's always, this is like, no, this is your role. And, and, you know, they're needed to be in that role for that person to preserve their position of power. Yeah, from what I understand with the BDSM side of things, as, as much as like the narrative seems to be that there is like these contracts or these agreements, um, it doesn't seem to be the case a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> it, it seems to be a mix of things. And so, yeah. and maybe that's where you've got like a lot of mixed <laughs> things happening. Um, yeah. And maybe that's, that, that, that's an issue because some, some do uh, engage in much more um, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert here, but like from my sort of understanding, um, some do contracts and very clear guidelines and have safe words, all that kind of stuff. But there is a lot of them who don't. And yeah. and and some are still happy with that and, and feel satisfied and, and feel like everything is hunky dory and consensual. But there's also cases where it does lead to, um, you know, people changing their mind, disagreements, feeling like the, there wasn't such clear defined consent in some cases. So yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of overlap here in some ways. Yeah, I think there are people who want to, they're happy to submit and play at this role, but I think it's not gonna, you know, some people are not gonna want that long-term. Maybe it's a short-term thing, but if there isn't some sort of acknowledgement that this is just for a period of time and then we'll want to move on one person might when it, it becomes abusive when the dominant person expects that person to continue to play out that role beyond uh the time that they want to play that role and some people are married controlled. so it is yeah forever. some people like, are married yeah, yeah so, and they're happy so for, and they're for happy before. i mean some people are married and are yeah. happy so it's not like it's a one yeah. one thing where it's always like a negative yeah. So that makes it, it's it just makes it very the parties, complicated. Yeah, it's, I think I'm saying one of, when one of the parties kind of wake up to the situation they're in and they're not happy, they're no longer satisfied with it and they want out and they're not given that out. Uh, they're not able to get that out easily. This is what we're talking about is an abusive dynamic because now this person, one person is no longer allowing the agency of the other. You know, they're not consenting to freeing them or allowing them to, to move on. They're expecting them to continue to play out that role. Well, you mentioned grooming a few times, and I, and I think that's mm -hmm. something that plays into it, but it's something that can be very difficult to tell. Like, is this person grooming or like, what does that look like? And how can someone even tell if that's grooming or that's just how this person feels and behaves? I think it, mm -hmm. it can be very confusing for, for people yeah so the first part is one of the <clears throat> one of the well, or both parties both people have to put out um you know narratives or uh, appearances about themselves that is appealing to the other person so often if there's someone who's the dominant who becomes the dominant one or is already the dominant one they're putting out like remember we talked about um tinder swindler you know they're putting out this idea about themselves that is going to appeal to a certain group of people. So that's already the first step. There's something about this one person that this other person finds appealing and wants to get to know a little bit more and, and be around them. That's the first part. The second part is now the behaviors. So there's three behaviors behind grooming. One is the excessive show of aff affection. So there's the love bombing, there's the giving gifts, giving opportunities, um, offering privileges, offering, you know, maybe insights to that person that they, that helps them feel better about something, you know, about themselves or whatever's going on in their life. But there's a lot, there's a lot of attention and focus and, and just um, affection at very early encounters. I'm not talking about, you know, down the track of knowing someone. This is upfront at the very beginning. So it's very mm -hmm. intense. And the other aspect is the purpose is to make that person on the receiving end of that love bombing and affection feel special and important and significant and valued. So it's not just, let me just be overly generous. It's I want you to feel special receiving these things from me. And the other part is um, getting them into an isolated 
um, situation where they can continue the love bombing and affection and specialness stuff. So they're kind of sequestered away from other people and they're given a lot of attention and they might be taken on lavish vacations or, you know, if we think about luxurious for someone who's very wealthy and they have access to all this luxury, this person on the other end who maybe isn't used to that sort of thing or needs that sort of thing really values that and, and wants more of it and they love receiving it. So that's a way to convince a person that this person in power is choosing them because they're special. There's something mm -hmm. about them that's special and important, significant. And then they end up forming a, you know, an emotional bond or a trauma bond <clears throat> for other things to start to unfold. Are the people, do you think the people who are doing the grooming, are they always aware that that's what they're doing, that, that that's their intention, or is it subconscious on some level? I would say most people don't know they're doing it. It's their way of getting people to like them, to want to be with them, to want them to want them or need them. Um, and then there's a percentage who do this deliberately with the intent to, you know, uh, extract and exploit that person over time. It's interesting because I think, I think oftentimes we think of, of people who are doing the grooming as, as kind of having the intent of, of knowing that that's what they're doing. But I guess often they don't, which makes it even more confusing and complicated because if they don't know that that's what they're doing, can they control it? Can they change their behavior? <laughs> it makes it more difficult to also look out for it in some ways. Yeah, that's the difference between someone who takes responsibility. You know, we, we started with, you know, consent and taking responsibility for the agreements you make or the commitments you make. There's some people who engage in these grooming behaviors as their means to attracting people into their life to eventually exploit them, that they'll never be able to receive the feedback that this is what you're doing to me. You're exploiting me. You're hurting me. You're taking advantage of me. You're trying to take my money. You're trying to, you know, infiltrate my networks and so that you can, you know, exploit my network for your own gain, you know, that person, they can't hear that feedback. So there's going to be no motivation uh, to change their behavior. They're going to continue doing what they're doing. Um, once they're sprung or exposed, they're just going to find their next person. Whereas those who would feel ashamed by their actions or, or you know, at least feel regret or remorse or, or some sort of pangs of guilt about what they're doing that causes them to examine their actions and their motivations behind them, there's a possibility that they would want to change their ways because they wouldn't want somebody on the receiving end. They don't, they feel bad that somebody they've hurt somebody or they've done that to a person, but you know, these are two different types of people, people who are, you know, accountability averse and those who are more um, happily, you know, more readily taking accountability for their actions and, and, seeking to make changes. Right. So that will have a bearing on, um, you know, the, the consequences of, uh, or the, you know, what unfolds in a, in a relationship when you tell someone, you know, your actions are hurting me. I, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I wanted to experience in this arrangement. So some people might go, well, that's your fault. It's not my problem. I never said that you weren't going to do this or this was going to happen. That's on you. Or, mm -hmm. wow, this is, you know, wow, I didn't consider this. I need to think about this and, you know, um, think about what, what I need to do differently. Yeah. Well, yeah. So kind of looking at the whole Andrew Tate situation, um, you know, it's interesting because I, when I first, you know, was bombed with like all these videos of him um, everywhere and, uh I had a pretty open mind. I mean, I didn't have any kind of innate hatred for the guy. Some of the stuff that he said was just uh, fine, made sense. Some of the stuff he said, I was like, okay, that's ridiculous. Um, but I'm like, okay, whatever. And until the court trial, um, yeah, until he was arrested in Romania with his brother, and, and some others, I, I didn't really care that much, but then I, and, and certainly didn't think he should be banned from anywhere, but he, then I started 
getting more information. And that's when I got pissed off. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, because um, now I, I never commented on, on the case itself because I don't know. And I definitely do believe in this whole presumption of innocent till proven guilty. So uh, let the court case play out. But there is so much out there that is not the court case. Um, yes. And like the lover boy scheme, where he basically says uh, all these things, you know, that he's he's going to pretend to be in love with these women in order to get them to do his webcam and they'll do anything for him. I mean, if that's not a classic grooming 101 in order yeah. to achieve a very specific aim, I don't know what is. And so, I mean, that I found incredibly disturbing. I found any engagement with his, a lot of the engagement with his, you know, fans pretty disturbing in terms of, you know, I, I think there were all these videos out there asking his uh, people who hate him to define why he's such a misogynist. And I think the problem, they would ask people who never watched his content, so they didn't understand. And then you're like, yeah. well, actually, <laughs> there is... <laughs> all this stuff now um it can absolutely say why but um but there is but the problem is you know these very specific things and this kind of definition of of i accidentally went in well not accidentally i went into <laughs> it's a rabbit hole come on you dove in. <laughs> I, know, I knowingly went into a twitter space that yeah. he was hosting and and i went in and the part that i overheard was him saying you guys are all losers you don't have girlfriends you don't drive lamborghinis you don't have this you don't have hot you know three girlfriends whatever his definition Classic. of success right <clears throat> of achievement was completely material and so, you know, so there's all these things that and and then what really pissed me off uh, on top of this uh, scam was this idea that the matrix is, is coming after him. And the reason that pissed me off is that it diminishes like the people who really are sort of prosecuted when they speak up against things, because what he's saying is nothing compared to so many people have been outspoken criticizing the things that are going on in the world right now and on a much yeah. higher level and have actually had to pay a price, right? And yes. and by yeah. him playing victim in this circumstance, when really the cases against him have to do with other things, and maybe they're coming after him for my financial motivations, there's could be all sorts of things, but it's not because he's saying things that go against the matrix. Yeah. And and him playing into that, it just it disgusts me because it, it it diminishes other people when they actually are speaking out. So that's where I uh, that's where my anger points are. But yeah, I'd like I'd love to get your thoughts after <laughs> I've gotten my whole rant out. <laughs> yeah, let it out. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because when people ask him, you know, why he's such a misogynist, he probably wouldn't think that he's a misogynist he's, he does you know you know like he doesn't even know what that means and, and people defend him <laughs> the yeah. women around him all the time yeah 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 so there's <laughs> he's been very successful at grooming a number of people into believing his propaganda about you know men masculinity and the purpose is to accumulate objects and things um and women being part of those things um and then disposing you know and using them as needed and then disposing of them when they become disagreeable or he doesn't see them as attractive anymore you know just just kind of consumerist uh, approach from uh i guess my understanding of what's been going on um but yeah to deliberately uh you know, groom women so that they can, you know, perform on his webcams and he could sell it. It's just, you know, horrendous. Um, and there's no, he doesn't think there's anything wrong with that. And the same thing, the matrix is chasing me. It's like, dude, there are consequences to your illegal actions. You know, they're criminal potentially. So uh, it's not the matrix, it's you. But he's not someone who is ever willing to take responsibility for his actions. There's always somebody to blame. Um, because he's so important and special and he's attained this high success. So therefore there's some sort of belief that that should grant him immunity against his uh, behavior. That uh, tells you a little bit about uh, 
the emotionally immature, the emotional immaturity in somebody like this who's managed to get away um, with this behavior and also accumulate, a, you know, an audience and followers and supporters because it appeals to their own insecurities and, uh, you know, a, a need to blame somebody and therefore I'm, they can take revenge uh, or, you know, take advantage of, of women or, or whatever, whatever population or whatever group in order to justify their, their stance and their pain. It's so you put in a enough group of, it's just a whole group who never have to take responsibility for their actions. And this is what he promotes. Yeah. Well, you put in enough of grains of truth too, because, okay, uh, I understand where some of this is coming from. Like, okay, males, masculine males are sort of, uh, you know, considered toxic, right? But masculinity looks in different ways. First of all, I think men should be where we, where we should be allowing is like men can look in different ways. Uh, they, they can, I, I mean, express themselves in different ways. It could be in this traditional masculinity, non-traditional, you know, ways that that should all be fine. Uh, but, but, you know, the traditional masculinity, though, doesn't have to look like, uh, you know, you have to drive a Lamborghini and have five women on your hands and, you know, and be all flashy. That oh, isn't so what hot. masculinity is, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Masculinity is like a, a strength. And, and uh, so, and I find that the women who sort of defend him, uh, I mean, specifically, especially when all these things came to light, right? Yeah. I, the motivation there, because the way that they sort of drag, some of them I've seen drag other women and even like, oh, I f forgot what the post said exactly, but dragging people, I don't know, like Cardi B, you know, we promote Cardi. It doesn't even have anything to do really with, with him, but like, okay, well, Cardi B, I'm going to do a defense of Cardi B now. Mm. Yes, she's she's she talks a certain way. She's she's not, you know, elegant. But you know what? She's very honest. She's got a certain kind of integrity about her. And she's she's and that's more valuable in a way, you know, mm. and um I don't know why I'm getting onto a Cardi B rant now. Yeah, I don't. I'm not familiar with uh, the things that she's been that she had said. Well, she, you know, she's got these long nails. She's got like she swears. She's she's kind of comes. She's comes from a very trashy kind of life. You know, she's had a rough life. She was beaten up. Uh, she was a stripper. She's kind of proud that she stripped because it allowed her to get out of her circumstances and become mm. what she is now. But you know, yeah. but I've also heard her say, you know, to her, she's like, I'm telling my child, like, you know, when we go visit family, you don't brag about the things you got, you know, because they. They might not have those things and mm. she keeps uh she she tracks her grocery bills and she if the milk goes up in price she knows that and she goes and does her own shopping and like she doesn't forget where she's from and she doesn't treat people like you know and she's very honest about where she comes from mm. and and i think there's integrity in that you know, and so yeah. to just take somebody and say, oh, well, that person has been around. She slept around a lot. Right. Because that's one of the things that uh, oh. gets criticized. Right. You're not you're a uh, high quality. This is one of the things. Right. Mm -hmm. You're a high quality woman. If you've had few men, you know, if, if you mm -hmm. barely slept around uh, and you're a, a, but but as a man, you don't have the same standards. Right. And, yeah. and they'll come up with all sorts of reasons to justify that. And while I'm not a huge fan of, of this culture where it's like, you know, everybody just goes around with everybody and, and there's no care whatsoever. I also don't, you know, that's, that's people's personal business, but yeah. to diminish, to, to define somebody's, you know, high quality or low quality based on, you know, how much you sleep around is just <laughs> nonsense. Well, well, it seems to be happening, you know, targeting women and men are heroes when they have yeah. lots of so-called beautiful women. And it's just the chaste purity feminist, feminine bullshit. It's just you're feminine when you can exude this like certain, these certain qualities of purity. And uh, that gives us, that gives, you know, society an excuse to 
pile on a woman for her behaviors when we no longer see her that way. It's just such bullshit. Um, but what you said about being connected to one where somebody's come from, what you described from your description of Cardi B, um, it sounds like there isn't a shame associated with upbringing. It's that she's integrated that as part of her. So she adjusts herself. She doesn't come back flaunting herself to, you know, uh, family or, or whoever she's visiting who might not have the things that she has. Um, she can humble herself and show respect. So that takes, again, a level of maturity and it's somebody who's obviously spent some time reflecting on their life and um, being quite conscious and okay about their choices and living into it without shame. Whereas we, when you look at someone who's constructed a persona or personality that is really heavily based on having material things and having this kind of consistent external appearance or reputation that appeals to a certain group of people, there's an insecurity about their past or their upbringing or their family dynamic growing up. You know, I think of these horrific men and I go, this is your mommy wound. And you're just continually getting back at women to try to heal this kind of rift that exists between you and this kind of matriarch in your family. Um, and it's not working. It's not going to work the way you're going about it because all you're doing is continuing to damage and your psyche is, you know, damaged in some way and you're not doing the therapeutic work to help yourself so you're just expressing it in this really dysfunctional way that ends up hurting others and to degree just keeps your wound open but they don't reflect on themselves they don't go in inward everything is external everything is about what i have and maintaining what i have or growing what i have um because that's the value that's the way i can escape my past yeah it's uh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think we have a lot of, uh, just in terms of general uh, power dynamics too, uh, in, in our society, I'm just thinking about, uh, I feel like it's so difficult because it, it's kind of inescapable in some sense. Like, you know, if you look at um, dating, for example, and, and you've got a boss or something like that, right? Well, it seems like a pretty bad idea to, to date your boss, it seems like a pretty obvious, but it happens, right? And, uh, in I, every actually, Korean drama, every Korean in drama. In every Korean it's drama. The boss with the secretary. Oh and sometimes it works out. I, I've actually had dinner with a, a woman. She, she runs a major network. Uh, she married her. Actually, she was the boss. <laughs> so, I mean, um, and she said, look, if, if we never, never crossed any boundaries, you know, there, there's a lot of marriages that wouldn't happen. But it's like, it's so hard to determine sometimes, you know, where, where you're crossing the line when you're not, because you're putting, you could be putting someone in a position where they're uncomfortable. And, and when it's at work, you know, that's, that could be very difficult things. Or sometimes it happens that, you know, educational facilities and that's uh you know I, I would urge people to at least wait till the person is no longer in your class but <laughs> yeah. if you're if you've got such strong feelings because it makes everyone uncomfortable um and yet at the same time we're human and we're messy it's very hard to be like a hundred percent perfect in these situations too uh, yeah, this, you know, there's some ethics, you know, there's some considerations around these power dynamics in a workplace or, you know, professor, student, um, you know, I've during grad school or, you know, um, researchers, so heads of their lab that end up hooking up with one of the grad students. And so you think about, well, what is that going to do for the rest of the, the group? You know, there's now it's yeah. very clear favoritism. How do you not favor that student who's now your partner um, compared to all the other grad students? So it, you know, it, it affects happen. the other people too. Yeah. It affected the whole group dynamic. And I know people are like in a hurry to get the hell out and finish their degree <laughs> because it would have, it just would have been uncomfortable, but everyone has to act normal. You know, that's the expectation yeah. as well. Like we just have to get on with it because that's us being professional and, you know, team players and all that bullshit, but it's that 
it put the whole group in a compromising situation. Then you'd be wondering about the grad student who hooked up with her supervisor. What's going on for her? That this is where she, you know, or what's going on between them that this, uh, this, uh, this happened. Um, and there is, you know, people in positions of power is attractive to so many people. And, but it also makes me think about the authority figure that the, you know, the more vulnerable or younger, less experienced person is looking, is seeking approval from. And that approval can turn into this kind of sexual attraction and be seen as this like, oh, but it's normal. We're just attracted to each other. It's like, no, there's some other power dynamic going on where you're needing this approval, almost like what you were seeking from your father and you're finding it in this father figure um, who's in a position of power that you associate with security and safety and your um, career safety or career security is embedded in this kind of weird dynamic. And now that you've hooked up with your supervisor, the rest of the group needs to kind of toe the line for their, you know, they're in a tenuous position. They need to finish their master's or doctorate degrees. They can't just start rocking the boat in the middle or at the beginning or near mm -hmm. the end. They need to get on with it, but they have to put up with this kind of sticky situation where they're seeing their colleague potentially having been groomed and um, entering into this dynamic where they think they're this empowered equal, but th they're also playing out some, you know, situation with with the boss who always needs to dominate some younger person to, to feel good um so this happens in workplaces as well and it's not always a sexual relationship it's some sort of favoritism where there's the pet in the group and others have to kind of work with that um or leave because uh if you get in the way of that relationship you're going to be seen as a threat and then others get recruited and the person who's seen as a threat can become the target of bullying um, because, you know, there's the pet who's been targeted. So they're going to be seen as the victim, <laughs> not the person mm -hmm. uh, or the people who are disapproving of the situation because it's compromised the group dynamic and there isn't the sort of equality anymore. There's this hierarchy um, not based on merit or, you know, talent based on favoritism. I have definitely seen a lot of that. Um, <laughs> I did. I did uh, go out on a date with my TA, but only after we fin finished the course. So I think ethical, that's Catherine. Okay. That's what. Yeah, that's yeah. ethical. Okay, that's yeah, good. Yeah, it's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> did get a good grade though, so I don't know if that's ethical. But I was yeah, good. So. Yeah, I'm a good student. But that was you being the student <laughs> and performing. It's up to the TA to grade however they're gonna grade. Correct. Like had a, Correct. A to you. Yeah. But you know, so these are the yeah. things we can't totally. It's really hard to separate our emotional landscape uh, and needs from our work sometimes when you're having a lot of contact with that person or exposure. Yeah, I mean, person. I did have, I do remember one of my favorite professors, but uh, but I I did have sort of a, some conflicting feelings in the beginning because he would meet people at. Um, coffee shops for one-on-one -on -one sessions but I didn't know that so the first time we had done that mm. and he he was also quite kind of blunt and he would comment on like physical appearance and things like that and I remember googling sexual harassment <laughs> and <laughs> trying to figure that one out it wasn't that mm. but he was a little too old school which I think got him a little bit of trouble um he was a very good, you know, life-changing professor. He hasn't crossed any lines. But even that, you know, um, caused me even some grief because there were people gossiping and saying things, uh, you know, that I was having an affair with him. And that, yeah. you know, most, that was like a very difficult thing to go through. It wasn't true, but, it, you know, that insinuation, you know, is a very unpleasant thing to experience when you're young and, uh, university and yeah, it's, it's like, you, you want to avoid that kind of stuff, even, even yeah. the appearance of that, I think. Yeah. And so the first place a lot of people go to is to the women who are meeting this professor at the coffee shop. Why did you meet him at the professor shop at the professor mm -hmm. shop at the coffee shop? Why would you meet alone? Didn't you, wouldn't you think that there's some other ulterior motive? My first go-to is professor, what the hell are you thinking? 
because as soon as you are seen publicly with another student by other students, they're going to start talking. Is this the kind of stuff that you're trying to, you know, activate in your, your class or do you want to just be seen as professional and not have any, you know, risks to your reputation? Um, but a lot of men and the older school men will do that because their reputation is protected and it will always the women will always be demonized because they're the younger, they don't have these positions of power. This, this professor is esteemed. He's been there for a long time. So he's probably valued by the institution. He's protected and he knows it, even if it's not a He wasn't thought. even, I will say he wasn't even that well protected. So it was so stupid of him, but I will say one okay. thing is that, so I he's will say one thing that- career. <laughs> yeah, well, I will say that the the students uh, that were so horrible at gossiping, um, would st I caught them taking more classes with him right? after <laughs> being wanted. so vicious, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm envy. like, <laughs> yeah, it was envy, and it's just like, yeah. goes to show the price that is paid is, yeah, not often the person <laughs> deserves yeah. it. Of course, and it's not something, and it's something that ha has have been, you know, targeted uh, for um, being in a certain position, or being esteemed, or being seen as the one who's the pet, or esteemed by this, you know, this authority figure who's high up in this hierarchy. So before, you know, these people in positions of power or authority um, having some sort of status, like professor or group leader or manager or something like that, they can inadvertently and unconsciously create this kind of hierarchy within a group of people. So if you think of a professor with a group of students, there really shouldn't be this sort of hierarchy in the group itself. It should just be like the professors doing their part, do, playing their role, and the students are doing their part, playing their role. Um, but by asking out certain students for one-on-ones, it starts to create this sort of, ah, so Catherine now has higher status in the group because she's favored. And then that creates, you know, that can support this envy and then the back talk and the targeting and the gossiping because they want to be in that position of this perceived position of esteem um, and higher up in the, you know, the social hierarchy of that class. We always trying to figure out where do we sit in this ladder um, to, and we always looking at who's got the most power or the most authority in the room and how do I get in closer proximity with that power so that I have the security or the safety or the grades or whatever it is that I value that I need in order to progress in my life. And we're doing these things unconsciously. Some people are doing it consciously and they're manipulating the situation. Um, they're playing with the, with the different people um, as entertainment or for their quest to, to climb the ladder but mostly we're doing this stuff unconsciously. So the minute you're seen having a one-on-one -on -one with this, you know, slimy professor, uh, they're not going, ooh, he's so skeezy, look, ugh. Um, it's like, I want what she has because there's something about her that, you know, obviously special enough that she got that invitation. I want what she has. I don't have that. I'm not getting that. So I'm going to look for opportunities to have that. So I'll take more classes with this slimy professor instead of. I mean, for the to. record, he was a fantastic professor. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he just had no, uh, not a very good self awareness. I think. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's yeah. slimy, kind of. <clears throat> maybe not presenting. He was not slimy. He was not slimy, yeah. but he, right. yeah, maybe some people thought, yeah. But it's confusing though when you don't know the person. Like once I got to know him, I understood what his intentions were. But but yeah. when you don't know, you're kind of like, oh, what's what's going on here? And so it can cause uh, some some degree of confusion because you're like, you know, <laughs> you're confused. <laughs> you don't yeah. know. And it puts you in a in a really interesting position because if you didn't know that he was asking, you know having one-on-one -on -one tutorial dates or whatever, um, and you're asked, and if you're someone who's quite, you know, critically, analytically be like, okay, why is this person asking me? Is he asking other people? Can I bring other people? Because what would it be like if people see us having a one-on-one? -on -one, what are people going to think? So what do I need to support my safety? So that might be going through your head as someone who's quite, you know, like red flag focused, like I am. Um, and then you'd be going, what if I say no? 
what are the implications for my grades, for my, you know, the relating. Well, they were, they were directed studies. So there were courses that I had designed. So like, uh, just to be clear. Yeah. So it wasn't but like, I'm he talking was just about, like, yeah. Yeah. We're not going to throw this man under the bus, but <laughs> yeah. I know I'm, I am clearly yeah. protecting him, but yeah. But yeah. yeah. Yes, I know. I see that. that you're doing the protection. I I am doing that because even because now I'm like looking back because even before we did the directed study, he, he we kind of met, but we met like on the roof of the building, and so mm. it, it wasn't conventional that I would mm. normally have like with other profs. It would be just like an office hours or something like that. But I did adore him, and we did become friends. So it was just like so. There is a huge part of me that's absolutely protecting him, and which yeah. is a tendency that I have. As as I think you you know me a little bit more, uh, so that there is something there that I yeah. have a tendency to do that. Yeah. Uh. Um, well, what I was talking about is those situations where it's not necessarily like you know a project or that is assigned to the whole class. Somebody might get a special project assigned. There's something in you that I see is quite, you know, talented or whatever. And I'm thinking you can do well with this opportunity, but you'd have to ask, are you offering this opportunity to everyone or is it just me and why me? What's, what's your, alter you know, I, my, my hackles yeah. would go up. I'd be like, what's your ulterior motive? And this is so common. And it, the person being asked, so the, position say me I'm the grad student or the the undergrad or whatever the employee I'm being I'm being singled out um and then I'm I'm in a quandary do I say yes and what what are the implications if I say yes and what are the implications if I say no and I'm I feel screwed either way mm -hmm. but then I'm the one at fault when I discover that I've been exploited or I've been um you know scapegoated by this person because I didn't do what they wanted um, and then others will be against me. That's, this is a common scenario that I'm describing. So nobody's targeting yeah. the, per, the person on authority for putting me in a compromising situation and a vulnerable situation. They're looking at me. Why did you agree to this? You must have known that there was an alter. You should have known. And so you hear that a lot. So, okay. So before we wrap this up, what are some of the things that you would suggest looking for for somebody who is like, you know, I guess these signs of you touched a little bit on it, but like signs, I guess, of, of grooming or power disbalances that one can look for and uh, and try to sort of negate against. Hmm. Yeah, there's a few things. There's the things that I know about myself and then there's the things that I'm seeing the other person doing. So for me, if I don't want to be put, enter into a relationship that could become uh, exploitative or put me in this sort of submission, <laughs> submitting situation with that person, I need to not need that person to make me feel special. I need not to that person to make me feel like I'm important or I'm, I have some amazing talent. I have to kind of call bullshit on it or just go, you know, that's not necessary. You don't have to tell me these things. I know these things about myself hmm. or I know enough about myself and I value enough about myself that I, I don't need the input from you who I've just met, uh, who you don't even know me, but you're making these claims about me as if you have some sort of authority to see into my soul and say these things about me. Like, we don't know each other well enough yet for you to even make those statements. So I need to have that about me as a sort of psychic defense against the, you know, the desire to be seen and heard and feel valued and feel important. Who doesn't want to be made to feel significant by someone we might, you know, who may be in this uh, superior position or in a powerful position that can help me out with my career or something that I, that I really value. Um, so the things that the other person will be doing is trying to make me feel special, important, give me opportunities without knowing me very well. Like, why would you trust me with this when you barely know me? They might say, but there's something, you know, I really, there's something about you that I just feel like I can open up. There's something about you that I feel like I could trust you. And mm -hmm. my red flags be like, no, like, that's nice. Nice of you to say that. But I prefer if we get to know each other better to see if this opportunity is actually the right fit. 
So it takes a lot from my end to be able to discern what this person wants for me. And I might be losing opportunities, but I might also be preventing myself from getting into situations that are compromising for me. So don't need to be special and be alert for those messages of trying to make me feel special, important, significant, offering lots of things without really knowing me, um, but claiming that they see things about me that are amazing and uh, they want to trust me or open up to me, share their secrets. I'm like, no, nah, you want something from me. Uh -uh. <laughs> so That's those are a few <laughs> tips. That's actually great advice. And a lot of it seems to rely also on yourself and not, not wanting things from other people, like not having assurances from other people, not, not relying on the trap of like wanting to be special, feeling special and finding certain things within yourself. So I think that's very important to keep in mind and very valuable. And I think that's where often we fall into those traps. Um, something to, a lot to reflect on for sure. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for joining me. <laughs> How do you feel about our first, uh, first ever live stream? Uh, I feel great. I mean, I'm not happy with my lighting, so I got to work on that, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> overall it, yeah, I hope people tuned in and will tune in and it provides food for thought, uh, for them. And I also hope we get some challenges and pushback because that's the most exciting thing. Yeah, I hope people, I hope more people engage. I think the algorithms today are messed up on my timeline. Like I, like it's really weird. Um, so like, cause last night I was just doing an audio test and like a ton of people just r randomly joined so just for the audio test. So and today is like weird, weirdly silent. So I don't know what's going on. Uh, I think it's probably all the people locking and unlocking, including myself, locking and unlocking our accounts. We broke Twitter. Uh, is, yeah. is my guess. Uh, <laughs> so I think that's what's happening, but this will be recorded and I'll also post it on YouTube. And so people yeah. can kind of replay this, but I think what will be really fun to do in the future is also, cause I can, I can invite other people to come up, like maybe mm. ask questions, make it more interactive. So I think that would be really fun to do for any future ones. Uh, yeah. I'm in. Fun. Yay. That'll be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the the conversation. Thank you, you for the conversation. Always, always just don't fun know to chat where we're you. gonna go. Yeah. I don't know where we're gonna do, go either. I filmed uh, uh, one of my forbidden conversations earlier today and we had a whole topic picked out and we didn't get to that particular topic until the very end of the conversation. But we had a fantastic uh, conversation anyway. So I felt like let's just go with where we're going and not force it where we were meant to go. And I think it worked out and we somehow arrived where we were meant to go anyway, so. Great, uh, was there any yeah. forbidden bits? Yeah, but I think that one was a little more of the more light productive ones. Um, mm. I think they're they're all gonna be really different. Like, um, you know this, I think I'm really excited about this series because is they're, they're all going to be really different. Some people are, are maybe a little more controversial than others. Mm. Um, and um, I mean, none of them are, they're not like meant to incite emotions that are meant to divide us or, or bring out hate or like, cause that's not what I want to do with this. I want to, I want to do the opposite, but so I want people to kind of stop and think um, and maybe, but they're on topics that might be a little bit difficult that need a, some attention and maybe don't get enough attention. Yeah. So conversations that are strangled or stifled. Uh... Yeah. More yeah, exactly. Can be had. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, and, and so I'm hoping I had this idea for one uh, last night um, that I would love to do, but I don't know if I can get. So I want to do a three-way conversation, actually mm -hmm. four-way, if if you include me. Um, and, and but I need to get three people who disagree with each other <laughs> on this particular topic, and I can get two. But I, but I need that third one, and mm. and I don't, and that third one might be a bit more difficult to get. But if I can get the three, I think that would be a really interesting conversation. Oh, I'm intrigued. 
Yeah, me too. <laughs> and, and I'll need to study. I, I'll need to study more on the topic myself because I'm not an expert. But I think I almost want to be a referee um, mm. because the, the three people would be experts on that topic. And then if they can just go between themselves and I'll just like slightly referee it, I think it'd be fantastic to have that conversation. Yeah. Um, that's what I'd love to do a little bit more of as well. And um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. So far, no yeah. one's turned me down that I've asked. So I'm like, <laughs> Well, that's good. And yeah, so moving from the one-on-one -on -one to seeing how you can manage uh, a three, three um, disputing parties and how to... Well, because I think with that particular topic, I think th there's three perspectives on it. So I think you can't... I think it would be only fair if you can present all three points of views. I mean, you can do it when you present one, which is fine, but it's far more interesting is if you can present all three um, and just get really intelligent people to talk about all three. I think it would be very useful. Um, and it would yeah. be useful for the three of them to hear the different points of views too. So I, I think there's something there. Um, mm -hmm. I have some other ideas that are uh, also about, you know, I, I did a tweet recently that was about how we were so focused on and complaining about things instead of bringing forth solutions and somebody some people are like well where's your solutions right so people complained <laughs> about my complaining okay. <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> <laughs> but um which is fair but i actually have some ideas of how to come up with solutions so i i have a project that i'd love to do and but I don't know how to fund it just yet. So yeah, um, isn't that the issue? There's so many solutions. There's so many yeah actual things, but yeah, the the funding is what matters. It's funding what and time there. are the two kind of pro precious things that yeah. are very difficult to to get. So for me, it's yeah. like time. And for this particular idea, funding is quite is something. Time alone isn't isn't enough. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it would be a really good, healthy um, idea. And I'm trying to focus more on the things that are a little bit healthier for us nowadays. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the, I think a lot playing of people the have gone the other direction. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are playing in the mud and uh, who, who haven't been playing in the mud in the past. And mm. I think their talents and insights would have been, would be better served, ser would better serve us and better serve them if they uh, got out of the mud and, and yeah. walked back to where they were in the past. Um, yeah. Outrage is addicting. <laughs> And yeah. being part of the, the being less being part of the conversation where there's this constant um, dysregulated emotional state is addicting. It's just another, yeah, yeah it's like another drug. Whereas the solution think... stuff takes time and energy and effort and lots of patience. It doesn't give you that high, that easy dopamine hit. It requires that long term perseverance. No, and, and you get reward more for in, engaging in and for mm. promoting the divisive stuff because um you know that's what that gets you the hits the likes yeah. the outreach machine the the praise the uh everything and so yep. and you see people engage in that so much and it's like uh you know that's to me is um it's frustrating and and that's the other thing i mean i was really interested in in um looking at models of how how can we how can we change that so the model rewards incentivizes other kinds of behavior because we can look at you know i, I did as a, as a little experiment like i posted a very positive nice video like i think it was a rabbit eating strawberries and that got very high engagement right there's Ooh. content that performs really well now that content the rabbit eating strawberries is very cute and fun it doesn't change the world it doesn't you know it's not intellectual or anything like that but it's nice it brings a little bit of joy into the world well and i think it does change the world because you're not activating people's fight and flight that you're helping them right. enter into a place of calm and like joy and all oh, this is sweet and tapping into the nice things that are in this world yeah. um even it for a proves, moment 
That's right, and it, and it but it proves that uh, because it's successful as well as the as the you know more kind of hateful, igniting, activating mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, it proves that both can be successful. So how do we encourage more of the former, more of the rabbit eating strawberries, or or just more you know knowledge, more things like that? Uh, I, I really love uh, Andrew Huberman, for example, who who tweets and shares a lot of content around you know neuro neuroscience, neuroscience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and how do we promote more of that and incentivize that as opposed to you know how do we tip the scales in favor of that kind of content so i'm i'm interested in kind of redesigning the social media structures since i wanted to do a research project on that and didn't yeah. quite work out <laughs> Elon Musk, can you listening to this Cut her up. <laughs> He, yeah. yeah, he's he only oh. listens to the you know <laughs> to memes. <laughs> well, yeah. he did listen well, to my uh, my Twitter Spaces uh, ideas, so maybe he'll yeah. listen to yeah, one. maybe. <laughs> well, if you know, it's a if those who are again, it comes back to who are the in positions of authority and, and who can make these decisions, and what are their values, what are they interested in, and where do they believe that is possible that can also be profitable um, that is different to the way things are generally done, which is again, outrage, dysregulation, which is not good for us. It's not good for humanity. <clears throat> Although when I read some of Huber Huberman's tweets, I get pissed off because I'm like, I feel pressured now to have to do all these things that you're saying are good for me. <laughs> um, and uh, screw you. <laughs> I can keep doing what I'm doing that are, you know. <laughs> funny. I'll tell I'll tell him you said that. <laughs> yeah, feel free to do that. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, but, but I think it's proven. It's pr like I I'm not saying, you know, you change people based on like forcing them into this change. You don't change people based on like uh, fake incentives. No, we it's proven that this works, right? That's proven that people do choose these things. So it's it's the uh, it's the mechanisms that are actually broken. So we as humans, we are capable of making these choices. That mm -hmm. has been shown. I mean, there is a Mr. Beast, and I mean, there's there's um, there's also I forget these guys. Very they make very positive content where they like do little ch challenges and travel the world. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of content like that out there that people love. It does very very well. Yeah. naturally organically right so i'm not suggesting we do we force anybody into anything um i'm suggesting that it already works and it is actually a technical issue in many ways um that it creates uh, a, a a false kind of an incentive that that rewards the wrong thing yeah. um and so i think we can you know there's always going to be some level of content that's you know, in divisive activating, all that stuff. It's just human nature. We're going to have this. Mm. But I think we can change that a little bit by redesigning the systems. And and I think that's something that can be done. Now, it requires a little bit of research and thinking and investigating. So it's done, you know, properly that we don't cause more trouble. Um, mm. But um, but I but I think there's something to that. So I I, you know, Maybe I'm not the one to do it, but somebody is. <laughs> yeah, where technically, um, or as Alex Friedman, it's an engineering issue or an engineering-based solution uh, where you flood people's timelines with this more solution-oriented content. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's or impactful content that's like beneficial at the same time. Um, hopefully authentic too <laughs> yeah because yeah. what can happen is all this like feel good positive shit that we see in many places uh, kind of attempt to erase or obscure some of the, the real issues that are going on um, yeah and the real issues are uh, important to address too yeah, yeah. that's how, how they get discussed um, that yeah there's the outragey addicts and then there's the well Yes, it's good to air the issue, but also at the same time air what are we doing about it or what is possible or what are the opportunities and what are, yeah, and that's more balanced for me.
Yeah, let's focus on the solutions. We do need to identify the problem. We shouldn't cover it up. Everything yeah. isn't hunky dory. Like I am yeah. not for let's just flood everything with just everything is great. Mm. Uh, no, we need to be able to talk about it all, but it doesn't have to be um, dysregulating. Dark. Dysregulating, yeah, yeah. And it's That's often what I mean by false, balance. It's too. more stabilizing. <laughs> Huh? It's often not useful. It's often false. It kind of goes back to my question of that I written about in my Substack that I said that it's the question that guides me. It's like, what's useful, right? Yeah. Sometimes it is useful to talk about things that are dark, that are problematic, that are troublesome, that we need to address. That is useful. Um, it's useful to talk about solutions. What it is not useful is to dramatize things out of proportion, to, to spread false information, to spread narratives, to just attack and not engage, to not be curious. It is useful to be curious. It is useful to have difficult conversations. So that's what, to me, it all goes back to. What is useful? Mm. Well... <laughs> Yeah. On that. And then I could say, yeah. And on that, we could go on and on, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, thank you for having this very useful conversation with yeah. me. Thank you for having with me. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>